very much. <clears throat> Thank you for this uh, introduction and uh, the invitation. And I apologize that I couldn't be here in person. I hope you can hear me well and see me well. So <clears throat> maybe one disclaimer, I'm a computer scientist. So the field of clinical trials and medicine is something that is of extreme interest to me, but uh, I'm not an expert, so I will show some results of our collaboration uh, with uh, my colleagues who are experts in uh, this domain. But yeah, you know, uh, I hope the inspiration will come more from the methods rather than uh, the results. And I will try to keep it lightweight and, and, uh, and entertaining. So uh, my main research interest is uh, in what we call geometric deep learning or machine learning on graphs. As uh, you know, um, graphs are a mathematical abstraction for uh, complex systems of relations and interactions, and you can really apply these models to uh, at different scales in biological sciences, in particular from modeling individual molecules, so compounds uh, like uh, drugs, so small molecules, as well as bigger molecules like proteins, which are typical uh, drug targets, as well as uh, more complex, uh, higher level uh, networks of interactions of these compounds, what is called um, uh, interactomes. So uh, what I will show you today is research that I'm doing um, with multiple collaborators, in particular at Imperial College, where we try to apply these techniques uh, and borrowing ideas from uh, drug repurposing and drug repositioning to the domain of food. And uh, we call this uh, hyperfoods. So basically how to design uh, disease beating nutrition using uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. So I hope I don't need to tell you, you're experts in clinical trials and you know that uh, in the recent decades, we have experienced a massive growth of chronic diseases, which includes cancer, diabetes, heart diseases. And one of the reasons is that we, uh, our population is rapidly aging. So the problem is getting uh, even worse. Uh, it has huge impacts on the cost of healthcare and uh, necessitates uh, maybe adoption of different business models moving from so-called sick care to real health care that will be uh, preventative. And one of the problems that you can attribute these uh, developments to is uh, our poor dietary choices. And there are multiple studies, one of them is quoted here from Lancet from three years ago, that um, unhealthy diets are responsible for approximately one out of five deaths globally. So in 2017, that was around uh, 11 million lives. And uh, this is, if you compare, more than from smoking cigarettes. And uh, what is more interesting is actually that uh, you would think that it's the junk food that is killing us, but in fact, it's the absence of uh, healthy ingredients, healthy foods such as vegetables and fruits that we don't eat rather than unhealthy, uh, maybe uh, foods that are full of sugar, uh, and uh, highly processed foods that, that we eat. And if we take as an example oncological diseases, so roughly half of us will develop cancer at some stage of our life. So again, it has to do with the fact that we live longer. But it also appears, and uh, this is also evidence-based research, that about 40% of all cancers could potentially be prevented only by dietary and lifestyle choices. So this is a huge number. So this is probably one of the, the most important uh, interventions that uh, probably every, uh, every one of us could uh, introduce and save uh, a lot of problems, uh, not only to ourselves, but to the entire healthcare system. And uh, if you look at the uh, state and progress in nutrition science, it has made really excellent prog uh, progress uh, over the past decades in analyzing six major nutrition categories, which are obviously proteins, carbohydrates, fats, minerals, vitamins, and water. But there is increasing evidence that we have lots of other molecules from a variety of chemical classes that uh, might have effects in preventing and fighting diseases. And uh, in plant foods, for example, these chemicals are responsible for the color, the flavor, the odor, such as the dark hue of blueberries or the bitter taste of broccoli or the unpleasant smell of garlic. And uh, the majority of these compounds are uh, unknown even to experts, uh, let alone the broad public. They are not tracked by regulators, so you will not, for example, find on the food packaging the, the content of flavonoids or uh, terpenoids that you have in, uh, um, in your food. And it's not surprising for drug developers among you that uh, many drugs actually come from the plant kingdom, and this is also sometimes reflected in their names. So if you take oncological chemotherapy, 
uh, a compound that is called campothecine, for example, it comes from, uh, is extracted from a tree that grows in China called Camptotheca acuminata, and uh, four of its synthetic analogs are currently approved for uh, as chemotherapy agents for certain types of cancer. Now, the problem with uh, nutrition is that it's extremely complex. So it has untapped potential and uh, really a dark matter that, that, that we don't really understand and we don't know what it does. But uh, it is extremely complex because uh, every bite of food comes with hundreds, if not thousands, of biologically active molecules. They also interact with each other uh, and with other biological processes uh, in our body, uh, with the, the bacteria in our intestines. And uh, that this is all makes it uh, very difficult and uh, complex to analyze. And uh, the experimental approaches that, that are traditionally used uh, take a, a very reductionist approach. So you study the effect of single molecule on maybe single uh, pathway at, at, at a time. And given the humongous amount of all the possible combinations and all the possible interactions, uh, this is really uh, intractable. So it's the analogy that my collaborator Kirill Vesalko from Imperial College makes is it's like using the bike to explore the galaxy. So it's uh, intractable. But what happened over recent years and what gives us hope uh, in these problems is, first of all, breakthrough in high throughput uh, molecular technologies, well, in genomics, in uh, high throughput chemistry that allows to, to make automated experiments uh, on a very large scale, including, for example, CRISPR uh, uh, perturbations, so allowing to understand the molecular machinery inside the cells that cause disease and, and how uh, it can be used to, uh, for developing new therapies. Uh, as well as uh, uh, also testing different chemical uh, compounds. And this uh, created a rapidly, a rapid growth of available data sets, some of them are also available in the public domain, that go way beyond the human capability to be analyzed. So we need really uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, computer-based techniques in order to make uh, some sense out of all this humongous amount of information. And uh, what we are trying to do with Hyperfoods project is to use uh, AI, even though I don't like uh, this term, better say machine learning, so basically data-driven uh, techniques that will allow us to identify these compounds and uh, predict their properties and put them to use in uh, nutrition that could help us prevent diseases, different type of diseases, but in particular oncological diseases. And of course, uh, given that we are talking about food, we also want this food to be pleasant and tasty and, uh, and rewarding because, well, this is one of the, the great joys of our life. Now, one thing that, we, that you realize when you deal with this kind of um, data is that uh, you need a serious computing power. And uh, this is actually where computer science uh, has made uh, huge progress, so you may know that Computing power approximately doubles every two years. This is called the Moore's Law, uh, uh, named after one of the founders of uh, Intel, one of the, the biggest uh, semiconductor manufacturers. And nowadays, your iPhone is more powerful than all the NASA computers that have put a man on the moon in the, the 60s. And uh, in the best case, it's used maybe for uh, social media and playing games. And uh, when you sleep and your phone is on, uh, uh, in bed next to you, uh, this power is completely wasted. And uh, what, imagine that what could be if we could combine the idle power of thousands of smartphones uh, to create a, a cluster, a virtual supercomputer that would allow us to help uh, uh, crunch complex data. And this is what we did in partnership with Vodafone Foundation. So we deployed machine learning using the Dream Lab application. So it allows users, uh, citizen science, sciences, uh, uh, scientists essentially to contribute the idle power of their phones. And this was a big campaign, actually one of the largest in the UK, um, with more than uh, 2 million people participating and uh, almost a billion uh, impressions on media. And it was launched um, a few years ago, uh, employing the help of um, the Star Wars uh, actor uh, uh, John Boyega, and it was advertised with this cool ad. And this one will sleep like a hero. So you can see him here responding to a call from his agent hero, isn't it? and contributing to our research. Oh, an ordinary guy. An ordinary guy. You know what? I like it. 
an ordinary guy fighting a one-man war against enemies from space. Against cancer? Okay, okay, I see it, I see it. It's more emotional. It's more in-depth. This is my moment to shine. This is my inner actor. I'm just gonna use my phone. I'm just gonna use my phone. One man, one goal, one phone. I like it. I'm gonna be a sidekick to an app that helps to fight against cancer while I sleep. You know what? I'm in. Oh, I'm in. Hey, I'm John Boy. I'm John Boy. So that was a few years ago. Well, and as I said, uh, there are multiple, uh, uh, almost two million people contributing uh, to this platform, uh, basically donating their idle power of their phones and as well as also sharing their experience. Some of them are uh, cancer patients or cancer survivors. Now, uh, besides the computational complexity that I mentioned, another challenge that you need to deal with uh, is also the complexity of the data itself. And uh, as you know, human biology is governed by an intricate network of molecular interactions, the interactome, and we have around 20,000 proteins that are encoded in our genome and uh, many millions of uh, interactions between them. And drugs are designed uh, to interact with this network by binding to, typically to protein targets. And due to the network effect, uh, this activates and disrupts multiple uh, biological processes a kind of uh, pieces of domino uh, that fall uh, if you touch one of them. And uh, even though the classical uh, mindset of drug therapy is you have one disease, you have one target and you develop one drug that, that uh, tries to, to uh, target this, uh, this particular protein. In fact, I think the number that I, I've seen on average, uh, a drug will bind to something like 50 or 60 different proteins. And again, because everything is interconnected, the network effect can be uh, almost unpredictable. This is one of the complexities of drug therapy that uh, everything uh, interacts with each other. And uh, these interactions are way too complex to model by hand, and instead we can use machine learning to infer them from the data. And the problem is that traditional machine learning methods that work well with, for example, image or uh, images or audio, and that, that has been huge progress in the past decade, they are not designed specifically to deal with uh, network or graph structure data. And uh, this is exactly where uh, my uh, research expertise and research field comes. So we are working on developing uh, methods such as graph neural networks that allow to take input that doesn't have the, the traditional structure of images or text or uh, these kind of signals, but uh, they can work on uh, networks and graphs. And uh, it allows us to, to learn uh, the network effects, of, for example, of clinically approved uh, drugs uh, to predict anti-cancer drug likeness or any type of uh, drug likeness uh, from the way that the molecules interact with biological networks. We can also, of course, use graph neural networks to um, apply them to the molecular structures themselves, basically molecules modeled as, uh, as graphs, but I will talk about it uh, later if we have time. And then we can apply this model to uh, look for anti-cancer uh, drug-like molecules in food. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, food contains many compounds uh, that come from uh, chemical classes that are similar to those used in, uh, in theory. And uh, our model was fed with thousands of uh, uh, food molecules. So, so we first train a classifier uh, that allows to predict uh, anti-cancer drug likeness using uh, FDA-approved anti-cancer drugs. And then when we uh, run this model on molecules coming from food, we are able to discover compounds uh, that are likely to have anti-cancer effect, and uh, these are uh, candidates such as uh, flavonoids, so this is the family of compounds that give fruits and vegetables their color, for example. And uh, at this point, we have candidates, so uh, as you probably know, in clinical trials or in drug development, this is only the beginning of the story. So the traditional approach would be then to do uh, experimental confirmation of the effect and the potency of each such molecule, and usually it's a process that uh, takes multiple stages, uh, years of uh, research and development, and sometimes goes uh, uh, into decades and uh, might cost uh, billions of dollars. So instead we wanted, well, obviously we don't have these resources, we wanted to see if we can use also machine learning techniques uh, to mine uh, the, the trove of experimental literature that exists, uh, animal and human studies, uh, medical literature, to back up uh, our discovered anti-cancer candidates. And 
uh, the amount of scientific literature on cancer in particular is enormous. So uh, I started talking maybe 10 minutes ago. Uh, in this time, on average, uh, there will be two new papers that uh, are published on cancer. So we are dealing with the amount of data that no human can ever single-handedly process. And therefore, uh, we use uh, natural language processing techniques that allowed us to look at the uh, candidate molecules that, uh, that we identified and link them to uh, anti-cancer uh, mechanisms such as anti-proliferation uh, or uh, uh, um, anti-angiogenesis uh, and other types of effects uh, that are associated with uh, typical anti-cancer drugs. And uh, basically, we use this to confirm, uh, again, from uh, medical evidence uh, of different, obviously, different uh, level, whether it's uh, in vitro or, or, uh, or clinical studies of the effect of some of these molecules. And this allowed us to construct uh, what we call a food map representing the ingredients with the largest amounts and diversities of these uh, cancer drug-like uh, compounds. And we found, uh, maybe not surprisingly, that common and even boring foods such as cabbage or tea contain significant amounts of uh, anti-cancer drug-like molecules. And again, this is not surprising. So tea, for example, is rich, uh, a rich source of uh, catechins and uh, terpenoids and tannins. And uh, it is known that they, they have strong and complementary anti-cancer effects. For example, uh, reducing DNA damage, suppressing inflammation, inducing apoptosis and uh, cancer cell cycle arrest. So many of these mechanisms that are also exploited for, uh, for cancer therapies. And there are several recent meta-analyses that demonstrate that, for example, the consumption of green tea leads to uh, delayed cancer onset, uh, lower rates of cancer recurrence after treatment, and increased rates of long-term remission. So it's not that, that uh, we are making it up, it is really uh, corroborated by, uh, by clinical studies. Now, of course, uh, to say that this is, uh, that that's where the story ends, I think it's just the beginning. So one of, uh, one of the issues is that, okay, let's say that we found that cabbage might be good and might have preventative effects against cancer. What, how do you use it? What do you, what do you do with it? So you need somehow to put all this evidence together and one of them comes to the fact that we don't have a single compound. Again, it doesn't work in isolation. Uh, there are multiple compounds that interact. And uh, so this is um, a figure from a study that was published in Nature about 20 years ago. So they studied the, the anti-cancer effect of apples. And it appears that apples uh, with the, the peel, with the skin on it, have better anti-tumor effect by like over 10%. And uh, the reason is that uh, it's, it's attributed to interaction of different compounds that are contained in the, the inside the apple and on the, the, the outside of the apple and that, that have synergistic uh, positive effect. And uh, another example that is also well known in, uh, in uh, uh, clinical oncology is uh, grapefruit juice. So it contains compounds that can interfere with the metabolism of some uh, chemotherapy drugs and as a result, reduce their efficiency and increase toxicity. Uh, so what is completely lacking, uh, from my knowledge, at least in uh, the types of cancer that we're looking at, is uh, any serious and uh, thorough research uh, on, for example, nutrition guidance for cancer patients uh, that would allow to avoid antagonistic interactions, but also hopefully uh, will allow food uh, to have synergistic interactions with the drug molecules uh, allowing the food to act as uh, co-therapy. And this is also something that is uh, now becoming a popular, uh, uh, popular topic in, uh, in medicine, what is called polypharmacy or combinatorial therapies, where multiple drugs are used uh, in combination, maybe in different doses or different regimes, uh, in order to, to exert the synergistic effect. And this is also something that can be discovered and validated using machine learning. So this is a figure from a paper that was a big collaboration with uh, Mila, the group of Joshua Banger, one of the leading experts in machine learning and uh, funded by the, the, Bill, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So in this case, we looked for uh, also anti-cancer drugs, but trying to combine them to achieve better synergy uh, compared uh, to the individual use of every drug. And given again that this is a combinatorial problem here, uh, well, we used graph neural networks to look at the interactions, to look at the molecular compounds themselves. So the molecule of the drug is modeled as a graph and we can predict its properties, um, some of the, the, the properties that are important for cancer therapies, but also the use of active learning allowed 
to do uh, what is called lab in the loop. So uh, instead of trying exhaustively all the possible combinations of these drugs, that would be very expensive or even infeasible to do in the lab, uh, we predicted a set of experiments that will allow us to better understand and explore the space of all the possible combinations. And then the computer guided the next set of experiments to do in order uh, to, to improve the, the predictive model. And therefore, with a tiny fraction of all the possible combinations, we're able to get to interesting uh, synergistic effects of uh, anti-cancer drug combinations that uh, could potentially be used uh, in clinical practice. So some of them were known, some of them were new and uh, unknown. Now, going back to food, one additional thing that we need to bear in mind is that the food preparation, food cooking involves also physical and chemical processes that may change molecular content. For example, exposure to temperature, frying or, or boiling our ingredients, many of these molecules uh, might disappear, right, or lose their potency. And that's uh, why we, if we want to, to design recipes or dishes out of these ingredients that we can identify with machine learning, we can also use machine learning to try to identify such processes that affect minimally the, uh, um, the molecular content or the good stuff that, that these ingredients contain. And uh, again, thinking in computer science terms, we can think of a recipe or a food preparation process as a computational graph. So in this case, the nodes of the graph will be different ingredients or different stages and the edges will contain uh, operations uh, that alter the molecular content uh, of, the, uh, of these ingredients. Now, obviously, we don't need to forget that in addition to these um, bioactive molecules, uh, phytochemicals, food also contains uh, compounds responsible uh, for its uh, taste, smell, uh, characteristic flavors, and uh, many foods share such uh, components and, for example, uh, you may find it surprising, but the fact is that garlic and tea have more than 100 flavor molecules in common. And uh, the secret of food pairing is to combine ingredients that have either similar or complementary flavor molecular profiles. And uh, this was thought to be some kind of black magic of uh, Michelin starred chefs. Now, at least potentially, this can be automated so we can use uh, graph neural networks and a graph-based machine learning to uh, analyze recipes for best food pairing, as well as combinations of uh, the, the, the active uh, biomolecules, and potentially also in the future uh, generate recipes that will strike the optimal balance between health, taste, and even aesthetics, and potentially personalize to our uh, individual dietary restrictions, allergies, uh, and just taste uh, preferences. And uh, maybe one day our computer-generated recipes will challenge uh, the, the top chefs. But in the meantime, we are collaborating with chefs, so we are not taking the human out of the loop. And this is Bruno Barbieri. I think in Italy he is very well known as one of the judges of MasterChef Italy. So this again was a collaboration facilitated by the Vodafone Foundation. And uh, here uh, Chef Barbieri uh, used the ingredients that we identified in order to propose simple recipes uh, that will convert all this good stuff that is contained in food into something that we can actually enjoy at home. And uh, again, here he is implicitly advertising the Dream Lab application, uh, sitting in his pajamas in bed uh, before uh, sleep and obviously donating the idle time of his uh, smartphone uh, for scientific purposes. So I think I will end at this tasty note. And uh, I, want, I hope that it gave you some uh, inspiration of how machine learning or artificial intelligence can be used uh, for maybe a less traditional uh, discovery uh, and uh, validation of uh, novel therapies. I think looking at it maybe from this perspective of uh, clinical trials, uh, you know better than me that uh, preventative effect is very difficult to confirm. So it takes very long-term studies uh, to see, for example, if consumption of certain foods uh, has a, a long-term effect on our health or uh, occurrence of certain diseases. I think uh, this is where we should go if we want to really change the healthcare model. But probably what is much easier uh, to do, and this is what we are now trying to do with our clinical partners in England, is uh, to use food as co-therapy. For example, uh, to develop nutrition guidance for cancer patients, what kind of foods could have synergistic effects with 
uh, with the, the anti-cancer therapies that are subjected to if they have cancer, uh, or at least uh, foods to avoid uh, in order to avoid antagonistic effects. And again, we can incorporate a lot of uh, uh, more granular information, such as the genetic profile of the patient, genetic profile of the tumor cells, if we have access to it, and so on and so forth. And again, the common denominator here is network or graph-based machine learning techniques that allow to package uh, all these data into representations on which machine learning algorithms can be applied. So I think I will stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. We'll be glad to answer any questions.